Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yes. Do we have any first time guests here? We do have one. We have a lovely, well, go get a uh, welcoming packet for him instead of pointing at him, Michael. No. All right, just a reminder that at the end of service tonight, we will be having communion. So those of you who are in the sanctuary, you can start preparing your hearts. And those who are watching online, you could get the elements together. But we will be uh, celebrating communion together at the end of service. Also, the Truth Project um, is going to be paused for the next two Mondays. One, one is because next Monday, Monday is July 3rd, and there's a lot of people going to be out of town, so we, depo- we paused it for that. And then on the 11th, it's paused because VBS is happening, and so plus it's Brian's birthday, he said. <laughs> So we're all going to Brian's house for his birthday. Uh, And then once again, it was such a hit this week that those who decide the theme for the potluck decided next week it'll be the same thing. Bring your favorite potluck dish. All right. Then the movie... uh, um, in July is going to be the re- return to the hiding place. It will be on the 29th of July at 2 p.m. So join us for that. Then, of course, we've got the July 4th outreach coming up. Um, it'll begin at 5 p.m. The church will supply the hot dogs, bring a side dish or dessert or whatever you feel like. And if you can't, don't just show up. Bring fireworks too. And we have VBS coming up on the 10th through the 14th. So there are sign-up sheets out there for volunteers and and also to sign kids up. So, And if you have any questions about the VBS, you can talk with Miss Corey or Cheryl, and they can give you all the information on it. We could still use volunteers for greeters in the coffee shop. If you would like to volunteer for either one, you can talk to Pastor Aaron, wherever he's at. And then we've got the church family meeting coming up Sunday night, July 23rd at 6 p.m. Once again, that's um, where all of the pastors and elders are going to be available to answer any questions you might have on anything from Scripture to, um, you know, the church and what's going on and just anything you can ask. Anything you wanted to know and you wanted the pastors or elders to answer We'll do our best to answer them for you that night. It's just basically a time for open communication with all of us there to um, be able to answer any questions. And then also on the the 16th, um, which is a Sunday, Pregnancy Care Center will be here to do their annual bottle drive, baby bottle drive, both first and second service on, on that Sunday. So... Um, it's a wonderful ministry. Definitely keep them in prayer. And like I said, they'll be here on the 16th. And with that being said, let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless the service as the worship team makes their way up here. So Lord, we come before you and God, once again, we're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for all that you're doing in and through this church and our lives, Lord. God, I pray now that you would anoint the worship team Lord, I also pray that you would give us just hearts to worship you because you're the only one who's worthy of our praises, Lord. God, I pray that you would just limit the distraction so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we give you this time now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would stand with me this evening. Excuse me. Wow. Oh, it's all that food. Hey, too much food. It's all that food. Um, now, before we get started, everybody put their hands together for all the people that brought the wonderful food tonight. Yeah. See, I keep making this a big enough deal, and them tables are going to extend clear out to the parking lot. So, Now, we appreciate it. Um, 
it isn't just a blessing to be able to come and fellowship and share a meal and and uh especially that shepherd's pie um amen whoever made that um but god is good it's a good thing to be able to come in the middle of the week and just uh take time out and focus on jesus worship him in spirit and in truth and hear his word being taught this evening and refresh our souls amen
Feel free to take a seat tonight if you'd like. song he's the well that doesn't run dry i do know though that the well in my vocal cords runs dry singing that song <laughs> but praise god <laughs> all right love this song 
really, I love the title of this song, The Heart of Worship. When the music breaks, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that'll bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, oh, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Lord. King of endless world, no one could express. How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required you search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you Oh, it's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made Sing that chorus one more time. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to switch this song with the next song. And because uh, I get to do that. That was more for the worship team and the sound guys. So... Isn't the heart of worship, if you listen to the words in that song, it says, it's all about you, Jesus. I love that song. I love those words. You know, it's all about him. The good thing of, well, there's many good things about being that it's all about him, but one of my favorite things is it makes it not about me, right? And I say that because it doesn't matter what I got going on in my life. It is about him. And when I began to understand that, Lord, this is about you, this is for you. God, I was created by you, for you, for your purposes. Then the things that we struggle with on this earth, they begin to seem less and less. Understanding that God uses all things in our lives for his glory, not for ours. He saved us. He rescued us. He redeemed us. And now he wants to use us. And what a blessing it is just to lay it down before the Lord at his feet because it's all about him. Lord, I 
The kiddos come up at this time. Come on down. The whole uh, right side of the room there. <laughs> come on. Oh, don't be bashful, little amen, brother. Yeah. So this is when we're done? Our blessings be your name. Okay. Come on down. All right. Oh, look at Zach. Come on down. He's still a kid. Yeah. All right. Man, we got a good group of kids here, huh? We needed a bigger church bus. <laughs> hint, hint, hint. <laughs> All right, grab your uh, instruments and come on over here in the front and join us. Yeah, come on up. Oh, Miss Corey said no. We'll have to talk to her at 9.30 tonight. All right, here we go. If you know this song, help us sing it. Blessed be. 
be your name The land that is plentiful Blessed be your name When I'm found in the desert place Go I walk through the wilderness Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out children father we just commit our children to you lord we pray you would continue to raise them up in your ways god bless miss Corey and cheryl and all the other volunteers that come to serve these kids lord fill their hearts with your spirit with your word tonight lord thank you for each and every child here this evening god please speak to their hearts father during their uh time here lord and help us to be ever so diligent and teaching them the truth of God's word. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, take a minute and say hello to somebody. You know, while everybody's making their way back to their seats, I don't know about you, but the thing that I'm most blessed about on these Wednesday nights is seeing all these kids up on the stage and watching them worship. It's my favorite part of Sunday, too, but, you know, hey. Uh, Oh, it's awesome. But just a couple of other praise reports other than, you know, just the kids and how much that ministry has grown. Um, I was able to uh, go over to the hospital today and see Helen Woods and, and Al. And uh, Helen's doing good. She was really alert. She couldn't talk because she was still intubated, but she was, you know, still... Um, giving me grief even though she couldn't talk. So she's, she's starting to feel better um, for sure, but 
I didn't stay a whole long time there just because she kept trying to communicate and choking. So, But uh, she's doing good, and then Al um, seems to be doing good. I, when I went over there, uh, um, the, I asked him how he was doing. He says, well, well enough to get out of this place. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's got a fractured pelvis, but um, he's raring the go, that's for sure. He's... It's not going to hold him down, that's for sure. And, and, you know, we went to pray with him, and he was like, I'm going to pray for you. I was like, well, are you saying, Al, I need it? He's right, I do. But anyways, no, it was great. He was in fairly good spirits under the condition, you know, under the conditions that he was in. And um, it was just wonderful to be able to see him. And, you know, he was... Before he even knows what his treatment plan is, he was already talking about making coffee at the church and cleaning the bathrooms. And, you know, it was like, one step at a time, Al, let's get the pelvis taken care of. You know, but that's Al, though. He's just a huge servant, huge prayer warrior. But definitely keep those two in, in prayer, though. But God is good, and, and both of them are uh, doing well. So, um, in fact, since we're here, let's, uh, let's lift the message up, but let's lift them up also. So God, we come again to you one more time, and Lord, we do lift up our sister Helen and our brother Al, God, and just pray that you would meet them where they're at there in the hospital, God, and that you, being the great physician, would just have grace on their bodies, Lord, that you would just touch and heal them. And so, Lord, we just lift them up to you now, God, uh, there's... Uh, the family here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass isn't the same without them. So, Lord, we pray that you would just be with them, comfort them, and heal them. And, Lord, as we get ready to enter into your word, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would give us hearts to heed what your spirit has to speak into our lives through Genesis chapter 13. And, Lord, that as always, our, we would just renew our minds, Lord, that we would be transformed that we wouldn't leave this place the same. So God, we give you this time now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, last week we were in Genesis chapter 12, and so of course this week we're going to be in Genesis chapter 13. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And so with that being said, you know, last week in Genesis chapter 12, we see, uh, you know, Abraham go to Egypt, right? And, you know, this great man of faith that we talked about, um, how it showed his humanity, and he had a lack of, of faith for a minute, or not a lack, but a lapse of faith. And so during that period of time that he had this lap, uh, lapse of faith, it's, it, it, it really brought comfort to me in the sense that, you know, it's good that a man that was so foundational uh, you know, in, in our faith and in the Jewish faith and even in the Muslim religion, you know, he's, he's so revered by, you know, the world religions. And yet the Bible, you know, talks about his lapses of faith, you know, which t brings encouragement and comfort to me. It's like, you know what, uh, if Abraham can have those lapses of faith, when I do, you know, I, I can also follow the the lead of Abraham, and we'll see how Abraham handled it, you know, because let's face it, um, each and every one of us here at some time or another are going to have those lapses of faith. We're going to fall short, um, but that doesn't mean that we have to stay there, does it? That doesn't mean that we have to stay in Egypt, which is always a picture of the world and our flesh, right? It doesn't mean we have to stay in Egypt when we find ourselves there, but no, as, it, as we'll read in Verse one, you know, it says he went up out of Egypt, you know, and we can do the same thing. You know, we can get up and get out of our Egypt too, can't we? You know, when we find ourselves and we can get back to um, where we met God at. And, and that's what Abraham does in chapter 13. And so as we get there, you know, um, We'll see his whole process here, you know, the, how the lapses of faith, they didn't, um, you know, although he was able to recover from them in a sense, 
there is always consequences for our lapses of faith, or our sin too, doesn't it? And it's well chronicled as we go through these next couple of chapters over the next couple of weeks that we'll see. You know, we'll see that not only did he go to Egypt, but unfortunately, he brought some of Egypt back with him, which caused some problems for him later, you know, and it, because that's what happens. Our, our lapses of faith in the end always cost us. You know, God always forgives us. We know that. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, we can recover from it. We can go back up. We can get back to where God would have us. But it always costs us something in the end. You know, there's, we reap what we sow, don't we? And in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, verses 6 and 7, it says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. If you'll recall uh, when we were going through 1 Corinthians chapter 10, here in context it was talking about uh, when Moses... They went through the Exodus, right? And what Paul was saying is that uh, as they went through the Exodus, we have them as an example of the things that we're not supposed to keep our eyes on, the things that we're not supposed to lust after. You know, they spent 40 years wandering, wandering in the wilderness because of their... Uh, their sin, right? You know, and it says, even as it says, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You know, they were, they had their own issues, didn't they? They were, God miraculously brought them out of Egypt. Um, and yet, all they could do is they wanted to turn back to Egypt, as, as you'll recall. You know, they, they say, oh man, it was so good in Egypt. It was so wonderful in Egypt, all the garlics and the leeks. And, you know, we had all of this stuff. You know, here, what has God done for us? All he's done is provided us this manna in the, in the wilderness, right? Who wants to eat this manna all the time, day in, day out? The food raining down from heaven. What about the garlics and the leeks and the the flesh pots of, of Egypt, you know, we want that. Why? They were turning their eyes back towards uh, Egypt, right? But what happens when we turn our eyes back to Egypt, which once again is the sign of the, or, you know, is a, is a you know, uh, signifies the world, doesn't it? You know, what happens? We read about their story a little bit more for context, and we'll talk about it. It says, now the mixed multitudes who were among them yielded to intense cravings, right? Uh, so that the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate so freely in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks and the onions and the garlics. Um, but now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. You know, and I, I always found this section of scripture interesting to me because if you remember the condition of, uh, of their captivity in Egypt, you know, that Moses, uh, um, you know, that God delivered them through Moses, um, it was horrible conditions. You know, it was so horrible and, and they, it said that they were burdened so much that their backs were bent. You know, you know that that uh, they were under such captivity and such oppression, and God delivered them from them, from it. But all they could do was look back to Egypt. Oh, the fish, the garlic, the leeks, and the onions, all of these different things that they had. You know, instead of um, and you know, and all we have to eat is this manna before our eyes. Boo hoo, God provided, and that's all we have. God delivered, and that's all we have. You know, uh, and they, they would have rather at that period of time set their eyes back on Egypt, to willingly go back into that bondage, right? Um, you know, willingly to live in the flesh once again, you know, go back to their sin. But isn't that the way it works in our life too? Is, you know, when God delivers us for, from something, when God does, delivers us from our captivity, 
It's interesting, the more God blesses us and the more that he provides for us, the more we look back and say, oh, we had it so great. All of those nights with hangovers and the time in county jail, and you know, boy, I, I, I miss the food in county, you know, whatever, I'm obviously making jokes, but that's really the way it is, isn't it? It's like, oh, the old lifestyle and the old relationships. It was so good. But you don't remember, like I said, the hangovers and the jail time and everything else and all the drama that went with it. But there is, um, you know, that's what happens, isn't it? You know, that, that we, we look back sometimes. And it's a warning here we see with Abraham, too. You know, as it said, he went out as we get more into it. Or we look at the nation of Israel as they were delivered and they looked back. You know, we can never, when God delivers you from something, when God takes you out of your captivity and your bondage, do not ever look back. You know, because I guarantee if God delivered you from something, he's going to deliver you to something that's much better, that's more fulfilling, that, you know, will help you live a life that's more pleasing to him. So don't ever turn back to that which God has delivered you from. No, run to what God is, is, is guiding you to, you know, because if you remember in the story of, 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 you know, the Israelites when Moses was leading them, God led them by a, a a cloud of a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night, didn't he? You know, God was always there and he was leading them. You know, God, you know, they would the if the if the cloud or the pillar of fire would move, the nation of Israel would pack up and they would move. They were always following God, right? You know, and that's the way we should be. Don't ever look back if God's delivered you from your bondage, you know, because there's always has consequences to it, doesn't it? You know, any time that we look back. And it's interesting to me um, just to study humanity in general and see how the mind works, how we can rationalize why we had it so much better in our bondage, why we had it so much better when we were held captive by sin. But when the truth of it is, it was horrible. It was miserable. We had no purpose. We had no, um, you know, it was just, uh, you know, we knew we weren't doing what we should be doing, right? You know, it's God doesn't, God has so much better for us. Don't ever look back. Romans 8, 5, and 6 says, for, well, I wanted one more point here about this verse, and then we'll move on. And that's the first part of it. It says, now the mixed multitudes were among them yielded to intense craving. See, when the nation of Israel, when they left Egypt, they took some of the Egyptians with them, didn't they? The mixed multitudes. And with that, they, took, they also brought along their culture, their gods, their sins, right? We know um, that... Um, the word tells us that evil company corrupts good moral character, right? You know, we can't bring along when God has delivered us um, the mixed multitude because uh, more than likely they're going to drag you down. They're, you're not going to be able to pull them up. You know, it's common sense, isn't it? If I were to take Matt here and say, okay, Matt, come here, I'm going to pull you up to my level. I'm not going to be able to do it, right? But if Matt wants to pull me down, it's going to be a lot easier. It's a lot easier for us to be pulled down. So, you know, if God's delivered you, don't bring the sin with you. Don't bring the people with you, that mixed multitude that it was talking about. That was their first mistake, the children of Israel. And so now on to Romans 8, 5, and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know, that's, you know, that's really the choice that we have, doesn't it? And when we, when we read the scripture here, specifically verse 6, it doesn't sound like there's much of a choice there. You know, it's like, do I want, you know, to live carnally minded and the consequence of spiritual death? Or do I want to live spiritually, be spiritually minded and have life and peace? 
I don't know, life and peace sounds a little better to me. I, you know, but we don't always live that way, do we? Because, um, you know, the Bible warns us, do not be deceived, right? God is not mocked. Uh, as it says in Galatians, you know, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. You know, God graciously watches over his people, doesn't he? He's jealous for us. But at the and he'll get us out of difficult situations. He will deliver us when we go back to Egypt, won't he? But whenever we do, it costs us, doesn't it? We pay a price for it. And that's what we see here. You know, if if think about this in the story last week, what if Sarah would have became one of Pharaoh's wives? You know, what would that have done to the whole story, really, of the Bible? You know, but luckily, um, because God knew that the Redeemer was going to come through that genealogy, uh, he protected it, you know, because he's jealous for his people. We know that. But just think about, you know, how much he had to pay because of his lapse of faith. You know, because in that moment, he sowed to the the flesh instead of the spirit. You know, we need to be careful of it because it does have consequences. And those consequences, you know, we don't always see what they're going to be. You know, that, that little flirting in the office that turns into an affair and the next thing you know, you're, you know, this, there's this uh, almost uh, imperceptible, uh, you know, uh, leaning towards and falling for this other person. And the next thing you know, you're in a full-blown relationship. Next thing you know, you're divorced. Next thing you know, your kids won't talk to you. But you don't see that up front, do you? All you see is, oh, this person's nice and whatever. And, you know, and was having a bad day. And so I'm just kind of, you know, being nice. And that niceness keeps going, you know. Um, but that's what happens, isn't it? That's how deceptful um, how much how we can easily be deceived in the sin you know we need to be careful that we're not turning back and that we're doing everything we can to make sure uh, that we don't you know that we because that disobedience that you know that gradual compromise that we you know we don't even recognize who we are at the end of it right it brings spiritual death you know I've seen it happen unfortunately too many times in, in the years that I've been in ministry. You know, people who wake up one day and they're in some pit that they had no idea how they got there because the enemy's not going to tell us that, you know. He's a liar, isn't he? Uh, you know, but that's what happens. It's like, oh, okay, there's this thing, bright, shiny thing over here and it looks so well, but the end of it's always death. When, whenever we turn back and we and we satisfy our flesh instead of the spirit. It always leads to death. So let's actually get into the verses here. In Genesis 13, 1, it begins with, Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that they had, and Lot with him to the south. You know, the Pharaoh had treated Abraham very well, right? For Sarah's sake, uh, and they went from Egypt with a lot of wealth. You know, you'd almost think that, uh, you know, it was a, he was blessed during all of this because, for instance, as we read in the last chapter, it says, so it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and female cam uh, camels, right? So as you'll recall the story, Abraham knew Abram at this point in history, knew his wife was very beautiful. And he said, hey, I don't want Pharaoh to see how beautiful you are. Come over and kill me and take you as a wife. So say you're my sister, right? And so that's what he did. And since it was Abram's sister, uh, Pharaoh's princess said, hey, she's a beautiful lady. I'm going to gain some points with Pharaoh and, you know, whisk her off to Pharaoh. But then God said, I got plans for Sarah. 
And, uh, you know, that is Abram's wife, and you're going to suffer the consequences if you don't give her back kind of thing, right? Once again, it's God protecting. And, you know, the thing about it in all of this, uh, where it says, where it said in verse 1 that Abraham repented, and he went up, didn't he? He went up and got out of Egypt. When we disobeyed the will of God, uh, the only right thing to do is go back to that place uh, where we left him. You know, God is the God of new beginnings, isn't he? You know, because in chapter 12, it says that, you know, he built an altar to God. And what we'll see is he goes back to the place where that altar was built, just the same way we should do, right? When we find ourselves caught in sin, when we're in the proverbial Egypt of our life, what we need to do is, like he said, like it said there, that he got up, you know, he went up and he ends up going back to that place. You know, we need to get back to our roots when we find ourselves in that place, you know, because yes, we serve a gracious God, don't we? Thank God. Thank God, you know, as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, the thing I love about the God that we serve is none of our failures are permanent, are they? You know, we can, um, we can repent and move on just as Abraham did here. You know, he, he, Abraham repented. He went up and got out of Egypt, out of that place where, you know, he went because of his lack of faith and went back to where he belonged. You know, I, I love that. You know, um, like I said earlier, if you were to just read this on a surface level, you'd think, well, it wasn't that bad. Abraham was blessed through this with livestock and servants and all of this kind of stuff. But, you know, the problem is, is with all of that, he brought Egypt with him. He brought a maidservant with him. Uh, and as we go on in the story, we'll see how much trouble she caused, you know. And so that's the key, too, is when we do find ourselves in that condition and we set our eyes back on God, don't bring any of that old lifestyle back. It has to be completely cut off. Egypt has to be left in Egypt. We can't take remnants of it with us. You know, when God's... Um, delivering us from our captivity, from our bondage, don't bring part of that with us. It's like, well, yeah, I was in chains here, but um, I'll stay handcuffed with one hand and, you know, the other one will be okay. No, we have to be completely free from it all. We can have no fellowship with it. You know, that's really what we see here, isn't it? You know, when we are delivered from it, um, we have to make sure that we go back to that altar, that, you know, that place where we meet God, you know, in the family, in the church, in the family of God here amongst believers. Because what's the first thing we do when we go to the foreign lands of, you know, Egypt, our sin, is we start separating ourselves, uh, you know, from the household of faith, don't we? We start taking the phone calls from the church members, our friends that know the Lord. We stop reading the Bible. We stop, you know, listening to the Christian music. We start distancing ourselves because when we don't or we, you know, talk to, oh, it's Pastor Aaron, you know, brings immediate conviction, right? I've told the stories before, and, and God has this ministry for me that um, I don't know what you would call it. It's just perfect timing kind of thing. But I don't know how often I go to the grocery store, and there'll be somebody in there that I've known for a long time, and they'll be uh, you know, with a, a big cart, and it'll just be full of alcohol or something. And you know, to me, I don't I don't care, right? It's not up to me, but I can see the look on their face or as they duck down the next aisle and I'm like, that was so-and-so. They just ducked down the aisle. Let's see, I, I could just, you know, let them have their peace and go down the aisle and not see, oh no, I run to the next aisle. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Lean against their car and you can just see the sweat pouring off them because it's, it's conviction, right? And, and uh, you know, it, it, it does. God just does that all the time. And it, it does it with, I can remember one time um, uh, my daughter was working at her work 
And this guy came in and he was drunk as a skunk. And, and it was funny because as soon as he went up to order his hamburger, whatever it was, he goes, oh, no, of all the people that would have to serve me right now, it'd be you, right? And I was like, that's the way God works, though. He sends people. Or one time me and my son were on the way to Washington and we're out in the middle of nowhere out. We got lost. It was raining so hard. The freeway was closed because somebody got ran over on the freeway and it was just a mess and I couldn't even see out the window. And we get lost in this town and we find a, a Dairy Queen. I mean, literally out in nowhere and walk in there and uh, it's pouring rain and there's this guy here that used to be in U-turn. You know, I'm three hours away in the middle of a rainstorm at 10 o'clock at night, and there was this U-turn guy, and he was like, really, of all people? I was like, well, think maybe God's talking to you? Well, I don't know. I was like, yes, you do. You might not want to listen, but you know what God's talking to you about. So, okay, that was a side rant, but we're, we're going to get back on track now with verses two through four here. It says, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. See, like I said earlier, Abraham went back to that place where God first appeared to him, didn't he? You know, that, where he had built the altar to God. You know, Bethel means the house of God, right? He went back to his house of God where God had met him. You know, he, to spiritually recenter himself, to get back, to, to get back in fellowship with God, right? It was that place. And, you know, it's, like I said, it's important for us to do the same. You know, when we find ourselves in those situations, just get recentered. Get back into the Bible. Get back into prayer. Get back into fellowship. You know, get recentered to that place where you were serving God, where God was meeting you, you know. Um, because, like I said, the first thing that we do is we get away from all those things. But when we wake up in our sins and in that moment and we realize that we're out of God's will, that we're in our Egypt, the first thing we need to do is get back to that place where God met us. We need to get back to Bethel instead of Egypt. And so then as it continues on in verses 5 through 9, it says, Lot also, who went with Abraham, Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. You know, isn't it interesting as I read this, you know, I, I think about, there was a series, and I don't remember the name of it. And the series, it chronicled um, people who won the lottery and how it destroyed their family. You know, all of this instantaneous money, how it destroyed their family because they weren't equipped to deal with it. How, how the people who won this money, you know, some of them committed suicide. Some of them, you know, killed their family members over the money. They fought over the money. And, you know, there was, um, in the show, a lot of them said, I wished I never would have won this money. You know, I wished I wouldn't. You know, sometimes where we think having whatever it is, like here with Abram and Lot, is such a beautiful thing, right? Oh, wow. You know, God really blessed him. It was so much. But if it's going to cause strife and angst in, in your life, you know, I would rather, you know, my prayer would be more like, God bless me as much as I can handle and not anymore, you know? It's one of those things where it's unfortunate, but a lot of times it's human nature. Did it, did it change who Abram was? No. You know, Abram was as gracious with Lot as before. But Lot, on the other hand, 
He was different, right? He was contentious. He wanted the best of the best of the best. Where we see Abraham, he wanted God's best. Yeah, he had lapses of faith, but we all do, you know? Um, and we see really, uh, as we move on in these verses, or if we move back to verse seven, really the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart, isn't it? You know, it says, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's stock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock, the Canaanites and the Preziites, then dwelled in the land. You know, that was Lot. You know, he was contending for the best. Where Abram, uh, we see, was more like what it says in uh, Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed, right? You know, Abraham said, hey, you know, there's angst with us. We can't be in agreement. So you take whatever you want. You know, I'm, you can have whatever and I'll, I'll go the other direction. You know, I don't want this kind of, um, you know, battle in, in, uh, or strife over something as dumb as land and money. You know, it's not worth it. It's not what's important. And so, you know, that's what we see here, you know, is we see, Unfortunately, it happens whenever we're in Egypt too, doesn't it? You know, and the reality is it happens in church also, you know, where, where there's disputes between brethren, where there's disputes, you know, um, uh, it doesn't even have to be over land, but just over, you know, the simplest of things. You know, how many times I've seen churches split or, or people leave churches over disputes that are really, you know, if you break it down, are over pride issues or ego issues or whatever, you know, and it's unfortunate. It's no wonder uh, that our Lord prayed for unity, that we as believers would be unified, right? Because if we are truly here and we're keeping our eyes on the Lord, then we should be one, right? Because we have that one thing that should unify each and every believer, regardless of our station in life, our social economical status, our culture, whatever. We have the cross, right? And that cross, the cross of Christ should unify us. And in John 17, uh, verses 20 through 23, it says, I do not pray, this is Jesus praying, and he's praying for us. It says, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through the, their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, and that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. See, there is nothing more powerful for a church's witness, for believers' witnesses, than walking in unity with each other, right? See, because we can go out into the world and we can be as contentious as we want. We can be competitive as we want. We can do everything we can to squash others in the world because that's the way the world plays the game, isn't it? But not so for us as Christians. We should be walking and stepping in unity, right? Because we have the common cause. We, you know, um, we have Christ in us that should be unifying us. You know, and, and whereas the world would say, you know, do whatever you can to get as much as you can, the Bible tells us that we should esteem others above ourselves, right? You know, just the opposite of that. And so when we, as a family of believers, are, you know, worrying about others before ourselves, we're esteeming above others above ourselves and we're walking in unity, it's a powerful witness to what God can do in someone's life, isn't it? You know, because we are different, we are set apart, uh, we are peculiar. We're, there's something different about us than, than the way the world operates. And that's powerful, isn't it? And I'm gonna knock over the speaker of this guitar before the end of the night, so. But you know, uh, Psalm 133 talks about just how beautiful and how fragrant and fruitful that unity is, isn't it? You know, as, as we read in Psalm 133, 
It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is it for brethren to, to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of the, his garment. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, it's true too. You know, and man, you know, we need to practice grace, don't we? You know, me and, me and Aaron always joke around about having buckets full of grace. But it's true because if we're supposed to, you know, carry around buckets full of grace, you know, God gave us dump trucks full of grace, you know? Uh, and so when we start really understanding, you know, our relationship and the unity or what should unify us, you know, grace should be a natural outflow of the spirit in our lives, shouldn't it? You know, where, where we understand that we don't always have to be right. We don't, it's not about us. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, then it becomes about him and all of these little things and all these little personality conflicts kind of evaporate, don't they? Because we're all focused on Jesus. We're keeping our eyes on him and not worrying about me, 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 me. You know, and, and really that's, that's what we as believers, as the church should be doing. It should be our witness to anybody who walks in from the outside wanting to see, you know, what's different about church, this church, right? You know, and, and then as we continue on, we'll see in, in really in James chapter 4 um, why Lot was just the opposite of that. Why he was a troublemaker instead of a peacemaker like his uncle, right? You know, Lot was like, no, I want the best for me. And we read in James chapter 4, it's really the heart of it in the first three verses. It says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet, it, covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. See, that's really the issue here, isn't it? All the contentions that between Abram and Lot, all the contentions between us, all the contentions that are there in the world, uh, you know, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members, right? It's about us. That's where the, they come from, all the contentions come from. It's because we want something, isn't it? We want this, instead of esteeming others above ourselves, like I said, either. You know, the world's wisdom and the world's uh, knowledge and wealth, it's all about me, 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 me. But God says, no, it's not about you. It's about me. It should be about us bringing glory to him. And there is nothing about contention and strife and anything else that brings that. We need to be more like Abram. You know what? It's not worth the fight. If you want to go to the left, you go to the left. I'll go to the right. I'll let you have the first choice. I'll be that gracious. You do whatever it is, and you know God will work it out from there, but we're not going to fight over it. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is because you know we know that when we covet, it leads to all kinds of evils, don't we? You know, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves uh, through with many sorrows. We know that, you know, that when we're, when we're seeking after whatever it is, you know, to, uh, for ourselves, and we're, taking, and we're putting our eyes on that instead of on the Lord, it's going to produce all kinds of evil. So then as the story continues, in verse 10 through 13, it says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. 
Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tents even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. You know, um, we know from what we were reading here, Abram, he caught, he, there was trouble, right? He was troubled in there. Why? Because he was out of place, wasn't he? Lot was troubled because he was out of place in Canaan. You know, he was, uh, he wanted to get back to the heart of Egypt. You know, said it, remember in the previous verses in 11, it said that like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar, you know, he was wanting, he carried that piece of Egypt with him. He wanted to be in Egypt and it led him to certain places. But, you know, in these verses 10 through 13, we see three kinds of men. You know, and, and in our spiritual walk, we're one of these three that's talked about here. The first one is the, the natural man. And you might remember way back a year or so, we talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And in particular, verse 14 tells us about the natural man. It says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, right? We saw that with those that were in Sodom. It said they were wicked, right? It, um, in particular, it said, so that I don't have to go back to, well, I'll just go back so we can all read it. But it said, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. This, they are the natural man. We see the, a picture of the natural men there. And like I said, the natural men, you know, these were the ones who does what is natural. You know, these are the ones that follow their flesh, right? They have no concern for spiritual things at all. You know, they don't even have an idea of what they are. They have no understanding of it. How could they? Because they're natural, not spirit led. You know, they're, they're controlled by the world and the lust of their flesh. You know, um, obviously, God is not pleased with this type of person. What this person needs is Jesus as their Lord and Savior, isn't it? Then we also see a picture here of the spiritual person in verses 15 and 16 of uh, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. It says, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. See, this is the person that we all should strive to be, right? This is the one that is saved and, and you know, uh, not only they're controlled by the supernatural, not the natural. You know, they understand and have discernment of the spiritual things, right? This is the person, they're taught by the Holy Spirit, and most importantly, they have the mind of Christ. This is the kind of person that God uses, of course, to uh, you know, lead others to Christ. This is the kind of person that we all should want to be. And then the last one was the carnal man. This is the one that kind of has their feet in both worlds, isn't it? Um, you know, wrong verse. Here it go. I'll eventually get there. There it is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we read about the carnal man. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you still are not able. See, the carnal, the carnal person does what, what is unnatural, right? They're saved, the carnal Christian, right? But they... Um, they feel the conviction. They're not following the Lord. They're lot, you know, because we know from the Bible, and we'll look at the verse here in a moment, it said that Lot was righteous. But reading the account here in, uh, uh, you know, Genesis, it's hard to make a case that he was righteous, but the Bible says he was, so I believe it. You know, it's that person who has his feet in both worlds. You know, they're kind of spiritual babies. They're immature and they're the kind of Christians that's worldly, right? Selfish, and they're the ones who are divisive, like we talked about. They're the ones that cause disputes, that kind of things, you know. Um, they're the ones that, quite honestly, need to repent. They need to, they need to mature into that spiritual person. But we see all three of them. We see Abram, the spiritual person. We see Lot, the carnal Christian. 
And then, of course, we see the men, the people of Sodom, who were the natural men, who had no spiritual beings. And so, but like I said, you know, we know Lot was considered righteous. It says, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them as an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. <clears throat> I find that interesting because in our story it says that he turned towards Sodom and Gomorrah. He pinched his, pitched his tent near Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet the word tells us that, you know, he was righteous and in, in that it tormented his righteous soul. You know, but that's what carnality does, doesn't it? We know better, right? We might have bought the fire insurance and we might be saved, but our soul's going to be tormented if we're living that close to Sodom and Gomorrah, if we're living in our Egypt, whatever, you know, we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, our soul's going to be tormented. And it's, we don't have to live that way, do we? No, when we do what God's called us to do, we're that spiritual man, you know, we sow the, we reap the benefits of peace and of life and all of the things that we talked about earlier. Whereas, uh, you know, when we're carnal, it's kind of, in some ways, the worst of both worlds, isn't it? We have one foot in the world and one foot in the, in, in, you know, with God. And so we're not ever really happy in the world and we're not really ever happy spiritually because we're trying to straddle that fence. You know, we need to be all in and all sold out for Christ. It's just that easy. You know, um, Lot could have, he could have walked with Abraham, right? Abraham was known as the friend of God, you know, instead of being divisive. You know, it says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God, right? Whereas, we see the, compared to Lot, who was more the friend of the world, right? He was nestled up against Sodom and Gomorrah. We read, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, right? We see the two differences in the types of Christians, don't we? We see him who was a friend of God, Abram, and we see him who was a friend of the world, you know, and it doesn't work, nor should it ever work. Um, you know, Abraham lived for others and not himself, didn't he? You go to the left or the right, you tell me where you want to go, I'll go the opposite way. It's about you, not me. You know, how should we be as Christians? Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Right? You know, this is how we should be living, right? You know, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. You know, be kind and affectionate. We should be loving, shouldn't we? We should be giving preference to one another over ourselves. Like I said, is it that important that we win that argument? Is it that important that we have our way? You know, of course, there's certain things that we don't budge on. You know, the, the essentials of our faith, we will never budge on. But there's the things on practical matters in the church and other things. It's like, is it that important? Is it that important if, you know, um, whatever the case may be, I ain't even going to come up with any examples, but you know what I'm saying. But what we do know and, and what we see is, um, as the old saying goes, what the eye sees is what the heart loves, right? We see Lot, he was looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. He was looking towards these things. You know, he was looking to those worldly things because he thought that's where the best of the best was. We read, but we know in Abraham's case, we see something different, don't we? In Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 13 through 16, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off were assured of them 
uh, embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Listen, you know, we need to have a light touch on this world, don't we? You know, um, because it's not our home anyways, is it? You know, it's not something that we should be spending all our time focusing on building our kingdom. But we should be spent the limited time we have on this earth um, building his kingdom or being used for his kingdom. You know, there's no greater satisfaction that you can have when you are the spiritual person and you're serving God uh, through the church in your family, in your life. That's what God has created us to do is to serve him. You know, and if you're not, uh, you know, each and every one of us should be involved in ministry in one form or fashion. All of us should be serving. There shouldn't be one person here that isn't serving. You know, I say it all the time. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose in this church. You know, we all, God has something for all of us to do here. You know, so let's, let's find out what that is and let's serve the Lord in the short time that we have together. You know, we have a great opportunity to do that, do we? You know, we have so much outreach. We have so many things going on in this church. And just look at the children's ministry on a Wednesday night. You know, the whole stage is so full of kids and yet there's not enough volunteers to keep them all going or, you know, to properly teach all them and be involved with all of them. You know, we have plenty of opportunities to do so. You know, it's like I said, if we got a pulse, we got a purpose, and we need to be serving in the church. Once again, it goes back to where it says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plains of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. You know, first of all, he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And, and this is a picture of, like I said earlier, how sin and how easily compromise, compromise leads us to that place. First, he looked at Egypt towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Then what happens next when we, you know, we play with that sin? We kind of visualize that sin. First, we look towards it. Then the next thing is we move up next to it, don't we? We talked about that. Then Lot chose for himself the plain of Jordan, uh, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent, even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Right? He moved towards them. And then what we'll find out next week, he moved into Sodom. Right. So first he looked upon it, then he moved towards it, then he moved into it. And that's the way sin works in our lives. We read about uh, in Genesis 14, 12, they also took Lot, Abraham's brother, son of uh, brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. You know, he was dwelling in Sodom. First he looked at it, then he moved towards it, then he moved into it. Be careful. That's what sin does for us. Verses 14 through 18, we're almost done here, and then we're going to have a time of communion. It says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from this place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through the, its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. You know, Lot lifted his eyes up and saw the best of the land, right? Abram lifted his eyes up to, to the Lord and uh, you know, he received the promises that God had for him, right? You know, Lot received a piece of land. 
Abram received the promise that the Messiah was going to come through him, right? You know, it's incredible to think about that, you know, as we read in chapter 14, Lot lost his family. Lot lost a lot of things because he was carnally focused, where Abraham gained a lot of things because he was spiritually focused. He was blessed. You know, and it's the same for us in this day when we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You know, it it promises us that we'll receive all spiritual blessings, doesn't it? Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You know, we have, the moment that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have the ultimate inheritance, don't we? You know, um, it's time for us to, really step into that inheritance, you know, by faith in the draw on it, draw on his riches and his glory. You know, as it says in Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, that's what we've been promised. That's what we can step into, especially when we're living that spiritual spiritually controlled life that we talked about earlier. And so now, as we get ready, we're going to enter into a time of communion. And as we do, um, you know, the one thing that I want to make sure as we get ready to pass the, the elements out is simply this. You know, if you, uh, have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, if you would be what was considered the natural man, don't take communion. You know, because as we'll see, it says that you'll bring judgment upon yourself. But better yet, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you can tap into all the spiritual blessings that we're promised. And then take communion as one of the uh, family, as part of the family of God. And so as the communion gets passed out, you know, uh, I'm going to ask some people, some of the elders and pastors to come up and be available for prayer. You know, do business with God and then take communion with a right heart, right? Because the word, as we'll see, tells us to examine ourselves. You know, because as we, as I always talk about, when we think of communion or we, when we get ready to prepare our hearts for communion, we need to do three things. The first one is to look back. And we're to look back at what Christ did for us on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance for me. Right? So that's the first thing that we need to do. We need to look back to the, uh, the fact that Christ shed his blood on the cross for us. Right? You know, we read in Romans chapter 5, It says, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. We also need to remember what it says in Hebrews 9.22, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. See, we need to look back and realize that if it wasn't for the blood that Christ shed on the cross for us, we had no way for our sins to be forgiven. It's only through the finished work of what Christ did on the cross. So that's the first thing is we need to look back. Secondly, we need to look within, right? As it says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You know, as we prepare to take communion together, we need to examine ourselves, right? We need to ask uh, the Lord if there is anything um, in our lives that is not pleasing to him. You know, is there anything that we're doing, uh, you know, um, like I said, that isn't pleasing to him, you know, and it's, it's simple. All we have to do is confess our sins if there isn't, you know. Uh, if you say that you have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if, 
We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're struggling tonight, you know, before you take communion, get right. Come, uh, come pray with one of the pastors. Confess your sins, you know. And, and then lastly, Paul says that we need to look ahead to the future uh, of what we have to look forward to. In verse 26, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He is coming again. You know, and we can take comfort in that, can't we? We can, we can anticipate that. We can look for it with uh, excitement. And so, you know, uh, with the communion, it's also an opportunity for us to look forward to his return. And so at this point, I'm going to have Nick go ahead and play a song. And while he's playing the song, it's just an opportunity for us to be, uh, you know, take some time with the Lord. And then once he's done, I'll lead us in communion. We'll pray and be done. My soul cries out to you, my Lord. My God, my heart is heavy and broken from sin. So I come to you, to you alone. You are. In 1 Corinthians, as we read earlier, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we are so grateful for your finished work on the cross, Lord. We're grateful for what, uh, that your body was broken for our sins, Lord, that you paid the penalty, the debt for our sins, Lord. God, may we never forget that. 
So, Lord, we are so grateful for what you've done for us. Lord, we love you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. If you partake of the bread with me. Scripture continues and says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So once again, Lord, we come before you and we thank you. Lord, we are so grateful for the blood that you shed on our behalf, Lord. And that this new covenant, that covenant of grace, Lord, is written in your blood. God, we're so grateful um, that we can have our sins forgiven because it was your blood that washed us clean, Lord. And so, God, we're so grateful for this time, Lord. We're thankful for what you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, just a final reminder, I didn't put a slide up tonight, but on Sunday we will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, the first six verses. And then next Wednesday, we will be in chapter 14 of Genesis. So with that being said, uh, let's just ask the Lord's blessing on the rest of this evening as we go our way, and then we'll be dismissed. So Lord, we come before you, and God, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for the way that your spirit is moving within it, God. I thank you for this night and the fellowship that we had with one another, and most importantly, with you, Lord. God, I thank you for the, the worship and the word, uh, just the so many uh, just spiritual gifts that you've given us tonight, God. As I prayed in the beginning, Lord, I pray that we would, uh, every time that we gather together here, Lord, that we would leave this place transformed a little bit more into your image, God. Lord, may us be those Christians the spiritual man that we've talked about, God, those that esteem others above ourselves, those who focused on you and, and not the flesh, Lord. God, may we be those people that um, when someone from who's a natural man comes into this church or um, crosses our path, Lord, they would see the difference, that they would see the light of your truth, of your love in our lives, Lord. So God, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you for all that you're doing in and through this church. God, I pray now that as we go our uh, separate ways, Lord, that you would give traveling mercies to everyone. And, and Lord, that you would just bring us back to your place, um, to this Bethel here, your house, uh, on uh, soon, Lord, and God, we just love you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, have a beautiful, blessed evening. And uh, just a reminder, there's plenty of opportunities. We have the Thursday night Bible studies for men and women, and then Friday at the Refuge Center, and Sunday back here. So God bless you all.